everyone this is the video i promised you just concluding the conversation that we we're having on thursday we ran out of time so i wanted to make sure that i covered the last four slides and at least gave you a little bit better of an overview of what we were what i was doing or what dan and i were doing in the paper that you read now i'm not going to go into a ton of detail just some final thoughts and then you can ask me questions on Tuesday if anything doesn't make sense and of course the slides for this are already available on Brightspace you also have access to the paper which goes through this in much more detail now something to consider is what were we actually trying to do in this paper and why did I sign it in the class so what Dan and I are trying to do in this paper is using our two ethnographies as we discussed in detail, using our two ethnographies and saying, what is all the talk doing in these two sites? And in particular, what about all this motivation talk? People explaining why they, why they ended up in the site and why they remain in the site. We wanted to know what that was actually doing. Now, as a bigger project, and the reason that I assigned this paper in class is it's an example of one of the options for what you can do in contemporary theory. There's a lot of different directions you can go, but in sociology, in contemporary sociology, in the discipline, we're very grounded in empirical data. You can make claims, but you have to back it up with some sort of methodological insight, right? You have to show whether through ethnography, through survey re research, through statistical analysis, through content analysis, all the different methods that you've learned about, all the different methods that are available to you, you have to show that something's happening in the world and build your ideas off of that. That's key. Now, what Dan and I are doing is something that Omar Lizardo called, uh, I think he called it um, the omnivorist cultural theorist, which means we're not saying any particular theorist is wrong. Rather, we're saying oh, there's all these great ideas out there. There's all these ideas that can explain the world, but there's also a gap or at least a limit to what they're saying. And you can follow a number of different ideas, different theorists, and you often end up finding the same type of absence or inability to explain certain things. In this case, you could draw on Bourdieu, who we read earlier in class. You could draw on Mead, who we read later in class. You could draw on C. Wright Mills, who you probably were introduced to in uh, Introduction to Sociology. And they all can point us towards thinking about what talk actually does, but they don't do a great job explaining it. Right? And they don't do a great job explaining it in different ways. So we're bringing them all together to get an answer to understand why there's so much motivation talk happening in our two respective sites, the Eastern Orthodox Church or the MMA gym. And by motivation talk, I mean talk where people are explaining what they are doing in the site itself, how they ended up in the MMA gym, how they ended up in the church, and then why they still remain or stay there. setting up this argument, which we did talk about on Thursday, is that the, sociolog the sociological literature on talk has shown that people's accounts of what they are going to do or why they did something is not that useful. So, as people's, so people saying they are going to do something isn't a great predictor of them actually doing it. And people's explanations for why they did something that they already did also doesn't actually tell us that much. Instead, what sociologists have argued, well, it actually does tell us something. It doesn't tell us why they actually did it, but instead what it tells us is what is a socially acceptable justification for doing the thing that they did. So it tells us more about the group or culture or society rather than the true reason why someone did something. All right, so let's get to the conclusions. And the conclusions are basically us restating the argument that we made. And specifically restating the argument that we made to show, to show the ways that it provides three different bridges in the pre-existing literature, meaning it brings together three ways of making arguments, three, re three very well-respected and recycled theories in sociology that are not in conversation with each other. And we show how they actually are not opposed to each other, but that our research can actually bring them together. And then the final thing that we do in the conclusion, which I'll go over, is make more of a method methodological point. Okay, so the first conclusion is saying this previous divide in the literature, this previous split, right? Decades of previous sociological scholarship and motive, talked, motive talk have placed a focus on how accounts index the normative constraints of social context. Again, people giving justifications for why they do something. So they're, when they're talking, they're explaining 
what are the social constraints? What are the social norms, right? That's what it's showing us. And they say that's opposed to a subjective motivation, a person's actual motivation for doing something. Our perspective specifically aimed to highlight how this is a false dichotomy. The way we do that is we say motives do not have to follow a strict linear path. In fact, we're arguing there's a benefit of taking a nonlinear, time-sensitive perspective on that relationship between action and account and motivation. So what we mean is that while we observe the actor's accounts at time two, that's time one and then time two, then time three, then time four, right? That's chronological order. So while an actor's account at time two did not appear to accurately reflect their motivation for why they initially joined the MMA gym at time one or joined the Eastern Orthodox Church. Because as I pointed out in the, in, in the paper and as I pointed out in the talk that I gave on Thursday, often the reasons, those initial motivations, when, when we were there when people had joined these sites, right, they appeared pretty ambivalent and weak. The actors themselves didn't really know why they were there. A lot of them said, well, I just showed up. I had this like feeling that I could check it out. I was curious. But by time two, they begin to be able to better explain what motivated them to be in that site initially. And even if that wasn't initial, that actually initial truth, that story motivated them to continue to commit to those actions at time two when they're telling it and then at time three, and then at time four, time five, and beyond. So motivation, in other words, is not best understood as just, well, is it true at time one? And then if it's true then, does it actually propel them to get to time two and so on? Rather, it's this constant evolving interpretive process in which your desires for why you're there may change and actually may take on more meanings. And so those post hoc justifications, the reason a lot of sociologists dismiss this stuff, it can actually transform and become sincere motivation and for a reason why you continue on, right? So we'll come back to this and I can explain this more on Tuesday if you have questions about it. The next bridge, because again, I just want to get through this um, so you can listen to it and um, tell me which ones are confusing. The next bridge is that our findings suggest accounts are most significant for influencing motivation at precisely those times when your habitual disposition, what some people call atom, uh, automat, sorry, what some people call, call automatic cognition or what we've called habitus, when they become problematized. So at those moments where you seem somewhat out of place, whether it's you're initially entering a site and you have some trepidation, but you see so you have that mix of curiosity and attraction, but also wariness or being even repulsed by the site. Your habitus doesn't match perfectly with the field, right? And it could be because you're just joining. It could be because you've been there for a while and you're starting to realize, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't know what my goal is. It's at those moments that the talk is important, right? And we found that when we're people for, were first joining these sites, that's when, when they're, that's when they are open for conversation and talk from the larger community. That's when they engage in the identity work. And there can even be a joy of being slightly out of place. Obviously, if your habitus does not completely match up, then it's going to do what Bourdieu said. It's going to kick you out of the site. But when it's slightly askew, right? When it's these suburban men, suburban men entering the MMA gym and they were kind of aware of these type of practices or they did a little sports in the past or they were sick of not using their body or they wanted to reclaim some element of masculinity or they were just curious about it, right? And it's not necessarily the place they belong. That almost becomes a source of excitement and that generates all the storytelling. That generates the identity work. Third thing, the idea of hermeneutic hooks. This is the term that we came up with in the paper that other people are citing and using. So I think of all the things that follow from this paper, um, this might be the thing that people take out of it. So what we're saying is hermeneutic hooks that propose where a meaningful connection between a course of action and actor's life story can be found. Those hooks, that thing that brings together all that storytelling and provides interpretive links between present action and more temporally extended autobiographies, that's what's key to keeping people in the site. And I said that in a little bit of a more overly complex or convoluted manner. What I mean is 
when those hermeneutic hooks, hermen, hermeneutic means identity or uh, meaning, ex, meaning like a search for meaning or a search for interpretation. So the hook is linking the experience in the site to these bigger things. So here it's about temporally extending the autobiography. I'm in this site and I'm linking it to, well, it's because I avoided that fight in the past and that's why I'm supposed to be here. Or, well, it's about the person I'm going to become in the future. Those are the hooks being made, right? That's the joy of being slightly out of place in identity work. And as you engage in it, right? Central question, why do people engage in strange, uh, strange and unexpected things? And what does it talk to? Well, it seems that self-identity is constituted in ongoing acts of self-interpretation. Self and the quest for self-understanding is itself a strong motivator for continued action. So here what we're seeing is the people who can hook the experience to something bigger, something in their past, something in their future, something in larger society. Those people who make those hooks, they're the ones who stay on the site. That's the key aspect of identity work, right? So that's, that's kind of the biggest takeaway. What is all the talk doing? Why are people entering these sites? It's to engage in identity work. And then the, all the talk, those are the ones that are creating these hooks between action the physical experience and larger meaning. Final point is, in a sense, checking the assumption of where the action is. And a lot of researchers, as they look at this type of thing, particularly if you're researching uh, something that involves more thrilling activities or even more masculine activities, they often end up focusing on the point of, well, what we are going to look at is the actual punching, the actual kicking the actual moment when people are fasting, the actual moment of conversion, right? Um, the actual ceremonies uh, in the church. And what we're saying is don't assume what counts and what doesn't. Don't valorize doing over saying. Rather, it's the interaction and intersection of the two that matter. How people talk about the actions, all the talks that surround the actions. And it's also a statement about the importance of place. The process through which talk happens matters. The places th that the talk happens matters. People have their talk have the talk on the sidelines, on the mats, on the chairs, on the edge of the gym, in front of the church, um, right after the ceremony, just as they walk out of the church, right? So it's still connected to the place, but it's all that talk that happens before and after that does a lot of the work building those hermeneutic hooks right? Attaching the meaning to the shared experience that immediately happened. That's where you engage with other people in the community. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, it's a little late. I'm a little tired. So my brain is not operating perfectly. Um, and just again, write down anything that confuses you, write down stuff you want to go over. Some of it could just be, Hey, what type of stuff do we need to know from this paper um, for the test? Just write down things that are confusing, submit it on Brightspace, and we will talk on Tuesday.